Hi, I'm Jill, Chief Safety Officer with Vivid Learning Systems. I'm a former OSHA inspector and I'm here to help you identify and correct workplace hazards. For this series, we are at the beautiful Monterey Bay Aquarium to show you that no matter where you work, safety is for everyone. Do you have employees who work in or near water? Perhaps you have employees who work on a bridge or a barge or a levee or a pool or a wastewater treatment facility or maybe you're working on rescue in floodwaters or during a natural disaster or perhaps it's at a place like we're at today at the Monterey Bay Aquarium in the tide pool. Regardless of where it is that you're working in or near water, you need to have some procedures and processes in place to keep everyone safe. And today, we're gonna to learn more about that from Justin, who is a dive safety officer here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And Justin, I'm wondering if you could walk us through um, some of the hazards that are associated with work here at the aquarium and in the tide pool area. Sure, there can be many hazards that are associated in an aquarium, such as drowning, but all the way down to slips, trips, and falls. Some of those things might require additional training, which we do on an annual basis for all of our staff and volunteers and that also would require additional equipment as well. Excellent, so what about some of the equipment that you need to have at the ready? What sort of things are we, are, are, do you use and do you prepare for? Working in a body of water like this would require the, to have a type four throwable PFD or personal flotation device. These personal flotation devices will also be uh, having a line attached to them so you can throw the line and the buoy out to the individual and then you could haul them back to the structure where you are. Mm -hmm. So do you have a, a Type 4 that you can show us? Yes, I do. I have a Type 4 right here. This Type 4 is at the ready, has the line in serviceable condition and is ready to throw to the individual all the way to the other side of the exhibit. And what's the requirement on the length of line that you need with this? So the length of line is, uh, should be at least minimum of the length of 75 feet for this exhibit here. Uh, if the body of water is larger, I would have multiple PFDs, one on either side of the exhibit, where you would be able to access uh, that if you were on the opposite side. All right, so it's really dependent on the size of where you are and where you're working. That is correct. Okay, yes. so what about the other PFDs that we have? Like, what? Tell us about the one that you're wearing. So this is a type three PFD. This is meant to be worn at all times when you're working over a body of water, and this Type 3 PFD is sized appropriately for me. And this is a large, you wouldn't want to put a large PFD on a much smaller individual because it would float up and it would not provide a head up uh, flotation. And what about the kind that I'm wearing? This is a Type 5 PFD. This is meant that to inflate when you pull the tab. This inflation um, will inflate and you put the line up over your head and then it'll maintain you in a face-up position. Okay, wonderful. And then any other equipment that you have at the ready as part of your response? Well, some of the other items that you can use in, an, in a rescue are a line, which would be a throw bag that you could use to throw to the victim that you would hold onto the line and use the throw bag to throw to the individual. Okay, okay, very good. And then how often are you doing training? You had, you had mentioned um, the, the training that you're doing, but how often does your dive team need to get together to build the correct muscle memory to know how to respond to the various situations you could have here? We do annual drills for all our staff and volunteers. If there is a, a change in the job or the gallery or the environment that they're working in, we will retrain each individual to be well-versed in the environment that they'll be in. Very good, so annual at a minimum and as things change, just like any other industry, when you have changes in work environments, you retrain your employees and it sounds like that's what you're doing here as well. That is correct. Very good. So Justin, I guess next we're going to go through a simulated rescue. Yes. Are we ready to try that? I think we are. Very good. So we're ready to start our water rescue simulation now. And a couple of things that we have in place already is an oxygen kit and I'm acting as Justin's secondary spotter. So Justin, can you describe to us, now that we have Sid, our victim, in the water, um, what's the first thing that you do? What's part of your assessment once somebody's in the water? Assessing the scene uh, and putting yourself into a potentially hazardous situation uh, is a very serious thing. So what you need to do is understand the hazard that you could be um, looking at. You, you as the rescuer? As the rescuer. I could be putting myself into the hazard mm -hmm. as well. So trying to, one, get them to do a self-rescue, 
and see if they can swim to the edge and calm themselves. If they cannot swim to the edge, they need to get to the edge of the body of water um, with your assistance. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those tools that you could use. This is a line throw bag. What you do is you want to shoot for beyond the individual. Mm -hmm. If you shoot for beyond the individual, you'll make sure that you lay the line over them and they can grab it and pull themselves into the, the edge of the water. Very nice. And so this is something you'd use obviously for a conscious person and someone who's maybe calm? Only for an individual that's calm and conscious. Okay. If a person is panicked, they need some type of buoyancy to get themselves up to the top of the water so they can keep their head above the water. Sure. And so for that is when you move into using the, the ring. Correct. The ring would be used in a way to give them some buoyancy and then it has a line attached to it as well which you could use to pull them to the edge of the water. Okay. So another part of being prepared is emergency response and so Justin maybe you can talk about that aspect of what are the other kinds of emergency response um, techniques and procedures do you need to have in place and do you need to be thinking about as the rescuer? Well another uh, emergency response item would be an item like two-way communication. You could use uh, communication like just a line and you could use line poles uh, to talk to each other. You could use like a radio. Um, being able to talk to the individual would help out uh, as well as radioing for assistance um, and possibly making an emergency plan to call for EMS of some kind, emergency medical service. Sure. So if it's obvious your, your, your victim may need some medical care from, your, from, from what you're observing immediately, you'll be able to deploy the appropriate response. That's all part of the, the emergency preparedness plan and understanding the situation. Uh, and going forward, you need to know what the steps are you would have happen. Sure. Very good. So now we've got Sid in the water again, and we can kind of pretend this time that maybe Sid's a little panicky of a person and they're going to need some help because maybe their self-rescue isn't as adept as you'd hoped it would be. So now you're moving into a different technique? So this Type 4 uh, throwable has a line that's attached to it. Undo the line. Unravel. You want to have plenty of slack so it doesn't get caught up. And make sure you hold on to the end of the line here. This line, you want to go and, again, shoot over the individual. And then you'll be able to pull them back into the water's edge. So at this point, it would give some, Sid something to hold on to, and you'd be able to pull them in. Correct. A panicked individual will grab onto anything that is floating. So we need to give them something to grab onto. So Justin, after you get the victim um, to safety, then what are some of the things that you'll be doing as a, as a dive team? Like what, are, what, uh, what sort of assessment will you be doing from there? Well, uh, assessing the individual would include um, potential thermal regulation issues. Sure. If they are really cold, uh, trying to assess them for uh, possible EMS requirements. It would also maybe a requirement for oxygen administration. Uh, worst case scenario for AED administration as well. So when you make an assessment of the individual in the situation that they meet, may need any of these things, I would call EMS, call 911, and get someone down here that would be able to provide potentially advanced life support. Mm -hmm, very good. And so you are practicing these techniques on a recurring basis here at the aquarium? This is an annual and repeatable um, basis that we do every year and if there's any change in the job, they do it again um, and again. Very good, very good. Thank you so much for your time today, Justin. Really appreciate it and uh, feel very safe here at the aquarium knowing uh, how well trained your team is. Thank you for being here. Yeah, you're welcome. I hope you gained a safety skill today. If you know someone who needs this, go ahead and pass it on. Safety is everyone's business.